everybody. I would just like to start by thanking the CCSN for inviting me to present this webinar. In particular, I want to thank Jackie for her dedication towards this topic. And Kimberly, you've been amazing with the logistics of putting this together. I also want to say kudos to everyone who's online with us right now. It takes both devotion and passion to spend a warm, sunny afternoon behind a computer, especially since we're just a few days into the summer. So thank you for being here. Oh, you unmuted yourself somehow, or you muted yourself. Okay, so I'm going to start from the top of the slide. I want to begin by setting expectations. Income inequality and access to healthcare is an intensive topic, and today is by no means an academically comprehensive presentation. I don't think it was ever meant to be. So today is really just an overview of the topic, and I have tried to provide links to articles and further reading at the bottom of each slide. And you can always reach out to me later if you want to discuss anything further. So let's get straight to it. You know, I'm having, I'm trying to go forward with my slides, Kimberly. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about two men in their 60s, John and David, and we'll put their lives into perspective and use the example of lung cancer as a way to understand their life stories. This will bridge us to the concept of access to care and an understanding of how needs are different depending on one's social circumstance. And finally, we'll touch on the topic of income inequality as it relates to the issue of access to care and end with a discussion on what we can all do about it. So a few gives and takes of the session. I hope that we can have somewhat of an interactive session. You'll find that we cover two polls over the course of the next hour. And you'll also find an area on your screen where you can upload your questions as we go along. And we'll try to get to as many of those towards the end. So let's begin by understanding why I want to talk about cancer. Besides the fact that this has been the focus of my research for several years now, it is also important to put statistics into context, really. And half of us will face a diagnosis of cancer over our lifetime. And Canadian cancer statistics point to the fact that one in four of us will succumb to the disease. And although mortality for cancer overall is dropping, that isn't quite the case for lung cancer. And in fact, for lung cancer, it is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers, and the incidence has been increasing steadily over the past few years. And that does have to do with the smoking epidemic that we had. But I also want to talk about lung cancer specifically, because it is usually diagnosed at a late stage, when the chances for cure are less. An important development in this area is a new screening tool using low dose CT that allows high risk individuals to be screened for early stage lung cancers at a stage when they have the potential to be cured. And last, but perhaps most importantly, lung cancer mortality rates are high and contribute to a great overall cancer related mortality. However, Behind average lung cancer statistics is a deeper story. And if we break down the statistics based on income, as you can see in this chart, where the bottom line on the line graph represents those with the highest level of income and the top line, those with the lowest levels of income, we can see that even for lung cancer mortality, averages do injustice to this vast difference in mortality based on income. And it's really in this context that I want to introduce you to John. 
John is 67 years old. He works as a senior executive for a global tech company. Although he no longer smokes, John has done his fair share in the past. He started to smoke with his peers when he was a teenager. However, he did quit smoking 15 years ago. John, right now, is just back from lunch with his friend. His friend works across the street in a law firm. His friend has told him about a new test that can be done to find any trace of lung cancer at an early stage when it can be cured. John, knowing that he spent several years smoking and is at a risk of lung cancer, is eager to do this new test. He's in his office right now, looking up the location for the test. He starts to make phone calls and he wants the test done right away. He's going on an upcoming holiday and he wants a clean bill of health. Just a few blocks away from John's office sits David. David pulls out another cigarette. It's well past his lunchtime, but nicotine does a good job of killing an appetite. David likes this spot on this particular bench. That's been one of the few things that hasn't changed much for him since he lost his job in the manufacturing plant several years ago. Other things in David's life have been pretty much up in the air. He's been in and out of a few odd jobs his family relationships have broken down, and on an average day, he doesn't know where his ne next meal is going to come from. David coughs. He's been coughing a lot recently. He knows he needs to go and see the doctor, but he doesn't have a phone, so he can't make a call to make an appointment. What he can do is go to the walk-in clinic and wait in line. But right now, David just isn't feeling up to it. He's tired and he would rather stay where he is comfortable on the bench. And such is the contrast between two men of a similar age who spend their day probably within the same one kilometer radius. And I want us to Consider for a moment that both John and David discover that they do indeed have lung cancer. How would their life circumstances shape their choices and ability to seek timely treatment? For John, he's likely to take a significant paid time off. He would focus on his rest, medications and recovery He's more likely to eat well and comply with all of the recommendations that his physicians suggest. And when he's ready for it, he'll get back to work. For David, the circumstances are different. Yes, he receives treatment in the hospital and the social worker will do her best to arrange accommodation. But really his focus is on his day-to-day -day existence. Completing a bunch of forms to get his medications is really a frustration. For David, surviving every day is as much a challenge as surviving lung cancer. So what is it about social location? And social location is described as one's position on a ladder of hierarchy and privilege and this position influences opportunities to be and remain healthy. And it's really through this storytelling that we can begin to use the example of lung cancer to tease out how these differences occur. And whereas David and John help us picture how social location influences health, let's look at lung cancer and lung cancer risk in a bit more detail. Let's start by talking about cigarette smoking. And we are all too familiar with the notion that cigarette smoking is a risky behavior choice. 
because it leads to multiple adverse health outcomes, including, of course, being a risk factor for lung cancer. What we do not hear often enough, however, is why certain social groups are more likely to smoke. We now actually have robust data that demonstrates how the incidence of smoking is correlated to the social location, such that those who are in positions of social disadvantage are more likely to smoke and there are a variety of reasons for this, which I won't be going into today. Interestingly enough, individuals from both higher and lower income groups are equally likely to try to quit smoking. However, those who are from socially disadvantaged groups are only half as likely to succeed in quitting smoking. How about screening? they're less likely to, to participate in preventative health care, including screening for cancer and lung cancer in particular. And again, there are a variety of reasons for this, such as lack of transportation, inability to take time off work, or culturally inappropriate care. What about incidents? We have data from several years now that highlights how individuals from lower income groups have a greater incidence of lung cancer, and specifically those types of lung cancers that are associated with smoking. In addition, individuals who are socially disadvantaged are less likely to receive a timely diagnosis and engage in active care, and they face a higher mortality due to the accumulation of risk and vulnerability over their life course. And if we put all these nuances in context, we can really begin to appreciate how and why these differences in mortality based on income or social location actually occur. An important point that I want to highlight in this graph is here at the red arrow, and this is 1984, where the Canada Health Act was introduced, implying that treatment for hospital and physician services were now covered through public taxation, or what we call first dollar coverage for care, or more commonly Canadian Medicare. And I want to point out how despite the availability of treatment without a financial barrier, the gap between income groups has pretty much remained the same. What does that imply? Well, for me, I believe it would be reasonable to assume that the availability of treatment is essential to reduce mortality amenable to care but that there are other variables in the mix that prevent this gap from reducing. And perhaps that is partly because they influence how care can be accessed. This brings me to talk about Canadian Medicare and what is currently covered in our basket of care. And we have three layers of funding. So the first layer is completely funded through public taxation. And through this, we fund hospital and physician services and diagnostic procedures. And the second tier of funding is a mixed bag of public and private funding. So we're talking about public taxation, private health insurance and out of pocket payments. And these cover a variety of things such as prescription drugs, home care, long-term care and mental health. And a third tier, which is exclusively private funding. And this includes dental, vision, and alternative therapies. Our basket of care has been described as both narrow and deep. But how exactly is accessibility defined in the act. 
And I've picked up this description or definition from the latest Canada Health Act report from last year. And I just want to take a moment to read through the description. The intent of the accessibility criteria is to ensure that insured persons have reasonable access, which is unprecluded or unimpeded by charges, such as extra billing or user charges, or other means, such as discrimination on the basis of age, health status, or financial circumstances. And at this point, I would really like to pause for a quick poll. And I would like to ask the audience to tell me what you think. Do you think the way accessibility is described in the Canada Health Act matches our current basket of care? And Kimberly will be helping me conduct this poll. It's very interesting to, um, Kimberly, are we able to share the results with the audience? Yeah, you should be able to see them now. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're up there. Okay, that's great. So everyone who participated in the poll, thank you so much. It is really interesting to see how we have a very um, unanimous vote on this. And if we were in a room all together, this would be a very interesting point of discussion. And I'm looking forward to connecting with some people after this webinar to talk about this in a bit more detail. Talking further about access, I'm going to pull up this chart. And I know this chart is extremely small in print, and my intention is absolutely not to have everybody read this. Rather, I'm going to use this chart to chronologically highlight how our concepts of access have evolved over time. And we can see that in 1974, access was primarily understood as the ability to enter the health system. And let me remind you that this was likely the very concept of access which fed into the Canada Health Act when it was legislated in 1984. Over time, this has evolved. So that by 1992, we're beginning to put perspectives of patients into the mix. And we are now thinking about how patients can actually seek care. By 1995, our perspectives have shifted even further from one of input to where people can reach the health system and we're considering outcomes and people leaving the health system with their health needs met. More recently, we've started to think about access as a more sophisticated balance between the need of populations and their ability to utilize it for the care that they need. And subsequent to this, we now have elaborate models that describe the different types of variables which we need to consider when we consider access. And for example, in this model, we can see that access involves the accessibility of providers, institutions, and systems. And that needs to be matched with the ability of individuals, households, and communities to seek care and have their needs met. For the purpose of today, though, we will be focusing on this model. 
of access to care by Richard et al. And we will use this to conceptualize access in terms of income inequalities. In this model, access depends on the adequate supply by the healthcare system, as well as elements that constitute demand or patient need. And whereas the ability of the health system to adequately supply care is, is very important, and there's no doubt about that, it's not the focus of today's webinar. Today's webinar, we're focusing instead on the dimensions of need. And we're going to use this to understand how is it that for David, his entire life journey has set him up for differences in the way he perceives risk, his ability to seek care, reach timely treatment, pay for medications, and indeed focus on his self-recovery. And before moving on to income inequality, I just want to mention that the interplay between living and working conditions and access to care is evident not just for lung cancer, but rather these factors play a profound role for several other cancers and several other treatments as well. And indeed, even for other chronic illnesses. And here I've just listed a few links for further reading if you'd like to know more. This brings me to the final component of our webinar today, which is income inequality. And I would like to proceed with a quick poll just to get an idea of what everybody thinks about the topic before we proceed. And it would be great to get feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kimberly. The question is, which of the following statements about income inequality resonates most with you? I'm not familiar with income inequality. I've come across the term. It's a challenge of our times, and it's an academic concept with little to no relevance. So it looks like today I'm pretty much preaching to the choir. Okay. Um, Kimberly, are we able to share the results with everybody? Yep, they're up there now. Okay, fantastic. So almost all of us are on the page where we consider income inequality is a pressing challenge of our times. Let's <clears throat> get into the topic a little further. And what is this beast of income inequality? Well, it's the extent to which income is distributed unevenly in a country. And I want to start by understanding how wealth is currently distributed in Canada by taking data from the 2016 census. And what we can see here is that the top income quintile group accounts for 50% of the national wealth. That's the top income quintile group. And together, the top two income quintile groups make up more than two thirds of our income pie. I was reading statistics from a paper the other day in which the author was informing us about how the top 80, 87 wealthy families in Canada currently own as much wealth as 12 million families at the bottom. So, whereas some may argue that average income has gone up for all Canadians, including those at the bottom 
of the economic ladder. So we see some gains over the years with the income going up. But the truth is that the wealthy have made far greater gains. And the key challenge is to understand what really has happened over time and how is it that the wealthy have been able to get wealthier. And there are several reasons for this, but I will briefly just be touching upon three. In the late 1940s, our taxation policies meant that those at the top paid a lot more in tax than what they currently do today. And our policies have changed since then, and we're simply not redistributing as effectively as we did in the past. Secondly, austerity policies or spending cuts that were introduced in the late 1990s led to a clawback in funds that were available to individuals. And finally, the average income of highly skilled professions has gone up dramatically as they get paid much higher wages. And along with that, they also get several other perks that allow them to accumulate more and more wealth. And we can really see this using the Gini index, and we can see this change in income inequality over time. The Gini index calculates how uneven income distribution is within a country. And using this chart, we can really see that we were at an all time low or period of relative equality somewhere around the late 1980s. And ever since then, our Gini index has continued to climb, which means that we are more unequal as a society. So what really is the problem with income inequality? Is it the massive accumulation of wealth at one end? Or is it the deprivation at the other end? And I rather like this health index. It's called the social health index. And I find that it's a great way to visualize how important variables in our society fit into an evaluation of our social health. And the Canadian Social Health Index, <clears throat> excuse me, consists of 15 different indicators, including, for example, infant mortality, drug abuse, dropping out from school, homicides, and affordable housing, to name a few. And what's really important to note here is that whilst our GDP has continue to go up or increase, our social health index has gone down. And most recent measurements <clears throat> tally that our social health index sits at the same value as it was in 1972. And really, this isn't just something that we see in an indices. If we look at our newspapers and things that we come across in our daily lives, it's increasingly common to come across the narrative or language of poverty, food insecurity, and an affordable housing crisis. And indeed, some of them, I'm not sure if they're humorous or reason to cry, because recent statistics point out that 96% of households have, a two, have two income earners. And increasingly, with parents doing two jobs, we're looking at four income households. So whilst income inequality really brings many social issues with it, such as loss of social cohesion, social unrest, volatility, lack of trust. Our focus today is really on health inequities. And 
we will come back to this model of access to care. And whereas it may be easier to appreciate how income inequality and austerity policies influence the supply side by leading to healthcare cuts and constrained budgets so that our health system isn't able to operate as effectively, we also need to realize that they also influence just as deeply patients' needs. And as we learned through hearing David's life story, that needs are not driven by his own individual self, but rather from the living and working conditions that are the foundations of his life. And therefore, I propose that we need to elaborate further on this access to care framework so that it consists of multiple dimensions an adequate supply through a robust and comprehensive health system, the ability to understand, respond, and cater to different patient needs, as well as the adequate living and working conditions, which will provide a foundation of fair opportunities for patients. And I really wanna to draw to an end with this picture. And I want to use it to encourage everyone to think about access in a couple of different ways. When we think about equality and our healthcare system or any intervention in our healthcare system, are we considering only input? And are we considering giving everybody a little bit of the same? Or can we also think about outcomes so that the end result is the same because we've been able to respond to different needs of different patient groups? But what would it mean if we were to think structurally and to think about removing structural barriers to care so that there are more equal opportunities for everyone? So in summary, what we've talked about today is that income inequality is the measure of an uneven distribution of wealth. And it truly is structured by the social and economic policies of where we live. To put it into the context of healthcare, we need to understand that income inequalities feed into social inequalities and that those <clears throat> social inequalities eventually feed into ability of people to lead healthy lives and access the healthcare system for their needs when they need it. In Canada, lower income groups suffer distinctly poorer cancer related out health outcomes. And there are a variety of reasons for this, but today was about access in terms of utilization. And we always need to keep that in mind when we consider access. I would like to leave everyone with this thought that income inequality is not inevitable. It occurs as a direct result of social and political choices. And because it is a choice, it means that we can make an alternative choice and that we are capable and able of making better choices moving forward. So what can we do? We can begin by recognizing that there are specific forces that create income inequality. We need to appreciate and understand how income inequality runs through the whole of society, impacting everyone, including not only the most deprived, but also the most privileged. We can improve communication between different sectors regarding the implications of income inequality and use media to spread education and control the narrative. And I think this is a big part of what the webinar today was about, improving the communication about the issue and using media to share information. What we can also do is lobby governments to maintain community health and social services. We need to resist cuts in public and social spending 
and advocate for a health in all policies approach. So thank you for your participation in today's webinar. I'd be open to taking any questions. So if people on the right hand side of your screen, there's the question bar. And if you have any questions, you can just bring them forward and we'll answer them. And just remember they are you know, or anonymous. So I'll ha ask then, Amber. Um, so for mm -hmm. the question, the poll we did, the first one, mm -hmm. where we do you think? One sec, I'm trying to get. Do you think the way accessibility is described in the Canada Health Act matches our current basket of care? Most mm -hmm. people said no. Do you think politicians are aware of this, or do you think they just are trying to ignore it? I think there's a lot of push for pharmacare at present. And it really boils down to the amount of pressure and force we as a society can impose. Indeed, when the Canada Health Act came about in 1984, it was not an easy feat. And that was the first step towards having comprehensive health insurance for all Canadians through public taxation. That was the first step. And we certainly need to keep on making incremental steps to improve our Canadian Medicare through recognizing what's missing and lobbying and advocating and voting for what needs to go in. And Perfect. I think, and then I have a, mm -hmm. oh, and go I ahead, think sorry. That all of us were in agreement about that um, just points to the fact that there is power in numbers. And we we should be rallying a force, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. And then someone asked, what role can patient support groups play? I think patient support groups can have several roles. For starters, I would love to see patient support groups involve a lot more members of society and be able to bring their participation to the table in a meaningful way. I think having as many voices on the table and being able to communicate what's needed and lobbying for where we feel our needs aren't being met is a power that patient groups have. It's a power that the health system does not have. So in that power, you can control the narrative, you can dominate the discourse on what's missing and what's needed, and demand for better care. Perfect. And then we have, how do we get to where we need to be when we are so far from where we need to be? <laughs> that is a million dollar question. Um, we we start small, right? So we begin with with ourself and our own self journey. If I think about my own journey, it started with really beginning to understand and see things in a lot more critical way. And we are kind of trained to grow up in a non questioning, a critical way of reading the media and taking information and policies as is. So we need to be able to reflect on that and take a pause and consider about what's not being said, which voice is missing, 
has the media or policy represented everything and everyone or only something and someone? So beginning with that self development is where I started my journey. I'm still on that journey. It's it's a hard journey. Um, another thing that I work on for myself is recognizing privilege. So I I understand that I'm privileged by virtue of my my income, my education, my seat at the table with many different stakeholders. And there are many other people who are not in those positions of privilege. So really trying to bring in that power balance and imbalance understanding to my mind when advocating for other issues. And then as as individuals we can communicate we can lobby and vote for things that are important to us and yes as groups we there's there is power in numbers if we can create groups to lobby for certain issues that's always much more powerful mm -hmm. okay and then the next one is if you'd like to comment on it but what are your thoughts on private privacy privatization of healthcare? And should people be allowed to pay for private health care and get a tax exemption for that? This is um, a very hot topic of discussion, but I think we have several studies from countries that have tried to do that. For example, the UK, where they have a system where people can pay for care and get what they thought would be quicker access to care for certain people if they could afford it. What we see years after they've implemented that is that it was a failed policy, specifically because when you have private institutions, private healthcare systems, they are set up for profit. And in that context, they are driven not for the benefit of society and people, but they're driven by their bottom line. And what we've seen in that context is that such institutions tend to provide more elective services which are easier to provide and are able to make more money. And that leads to a greater burden on the public health care system. So whereas it may look like a very charming way out for certain people, it is detrimental for everybody in the long term. And we have studies from other countries that actually support that. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, any more questions? So there's one that's a statement, see if you have any suggestions to it. It's that she's a healthcare worker who is very concerned with how patients and their mm -hmm. care caregivers, supporter systems manage an increasingly complex health system. The healthcare mm -hmm. organizations stress patient autonomy as keyword, key buzzwords, but my lived experience is that this means making patients responsible for guiding their way themselves. I know that people without supports are falling very behind and they're, these are primarily the lower income, less educated, and quite frankly, the most sick individuals. Mm -hmm. Patient autonomy seems like an excuse to not provide the help required to support these people. Do you have any suggestions with that? No, I, I agree completely. And it's something that, that I see on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And what's happened through the individualization of care and has been and this is also with the health promotion discourse where we see a lot of finger pointing saying well we we need to lose weight you know we need to eat 
better, we need to stop smoking, we need to exercise. And those are very individual driven um, uh, indications, which are not necessarily in in consistency with the environment in which the individual would be living. So it's easy to point at individuals and say, you should be responsible for taking this decision. These are your choices. But if we don't keep them in the context of what the limitations of their choices are, we not only do we increase health inequities, but I think we also create distrust of the system because what patients are being told to do is at odds with what they are able to do. So I think I think it's it's not good for a variety of reasons. Perfect. And then um, I have someone requesting the studies on private healthcare access. Yeah, sure. Would you mm -hmm. be able to send them to me and I could send them on? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I just wait another minute, see if there's any other questions. Would you like to say any last words, Dr. Embry? Um, again, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me here to this platform to share this discussion. I realized it was very high level key concept sort of discussion and perhaps we can go into things in a little bit more detail on a more focused topic in the future. And it was, uh, it was very interesting for me to do the polls and to realize how all of us agree on the fact that our current basket of care needs to change and it was also interesting for me to see that we all agree that income inequality is a pressing challenge of our times so for me where do we go from here is what's important and i hope we can we can come to some sort of alliance together yeah, so thank you for that thank you